professional organizer. Thank you. Very sweet. Uh, has anybody here ever worked with an organizer before? No? Oh, unusual. Usually I get like one hand. Um, is anybody an organizer? Every now and then I'll have one in my class, which I love to be able to bounce ideas back and forth. Uh, so I've been doing this job about 12 years. I love what I do. I always joke and say that I make OCD work for me. <laughs> um, I've had clients all over the spectrum. I've dealt with people who are probably falling into the hoarding category, and then just people who kind of life change, need a little, little sprucing up. Um, so the first thing we'll talk about, everybody have a handout? So the first thing is uh, the categories of why people feel or are, in fact, disorganized. So number one, they just never learned how to organize. Maybe they had parents who weren't organized. It was just a skill set they never got. Number two, this is a problem for a lot of people, too much stuff, right? When you boil it down, it often comes to too much stuff. And number three, people who have gone through a life change, new job, death in the family, new children, new marriage. And a lot of times, these come with combinations. So sometimes you can be all three. <laughs> I'm kind of disorganized. I have too much stuff and major life changes, right? That means there's probably a lot of chaos. But there's hope. There's hope. So I'm going to go over today five steps for you to face any room, any space, right? Uh, for most people, for who I work with anyway, it's usually a kitchen or a home office. I would say those are the two most popular spaces. Or it's that long-term storage, garage, attic, basement, you know, the place where things go to never be seen again. <laughs> One of those spaces. So in order to identify the space that you want to work with, it's really easy. Think about the space in your home that you never want to step foot into. What's the room where you're like, I just can't deal with it today? That's usually a fantastic place to start. <laughs> so if you look in that room, and let me say that that's, that's really step one. It's, it's that easy. Pick your space. What space do you just, it drives you crazy. You think to yourself, if this space worked, my life could be different. When you're done that, you're done step one. Move on. Have a cup of tea. Celebrate. Step two. Step two is when you go into that space and you literally write everything down that you see. What's in this room? Now, for some of you, I can, <laughs> I can hear the laughter. That may be a huge step, and that may take more than an afternoon. That may take more than a Saturday. The reason you're doing this is you're being very thoughtful about what's in this space. Once your list is complete, and I mean really everything, pull open drawers, open up doors, open up closets, and really look at, what am I keeping in this room? Now again, once the list is done, take a step back. You've done enough. Take a deep breath. When you're re-energized, go back to that list and start looking at what actually belongs in this room. It's kind of a, a shocking process when I've worked with someone and they think to themselves, I really thought this was just my home office. But it really has become the space where things go to die or disappear. <laughs> and when you realize, OK, I'm just chucking stuff in here, some of that stuff may have a permanent home that you can now go put it away in the right space. It just kind of landed there on a busy day or when you were trying to stuff things when company is coming. I have a lot of stuffers that I work with. I don't know if anybody relates to that. But uh, it might have just landed there temporarily. The other types of things you're going to find in that room, though, are things that have just never been given a home. You kind of intentionally meant to do that at some point, but it just doesn't have a home yet. So what you need to decide is make a check on your list of the things that stay in that room. Put away the things that have a home in another room. Right? Pretty, pretty easy so far. Now you're left with the stuff that you're not really sure where this belongs. But I think for most of us, if we kind of think about that kindergarten model of organization, probably the blender doesn't need to be in your home office. Right? <laughs> like probably that doesn't need to live there. So now may be a great time to identify where that should live and try to make space for that somewhere else. This is the tricky step, though. When you're putting things away that don't belong in that room, you may walk into another space that is also a little bit disorganized. <laughs> don't get sidetracked. Put it away. Come back to the main space that you're working on. OK? When it gets to the stuff that doesn't really have a home, you're not sure if it belongs there, this is a great time to brainstorm. Somebody knock on the door. <laughs> this is a great time to brainstorm. So if you want to get other family members involved and ask them, do you think this makes sense in this room? Any ideas on how we could store this? Does this belong in a cabinet, a filing cabinet, a shelf, a closet? Kind of come up with some good ideas. 
This is also a step where a lot of people decide that they need inspiration and they go shopping. Don't do that yet. <laughs> I've had a lot of clients who go to places like the Container Store, or as I like to call it, Mecca. They go there and they buy these really great things and they're super, super cute and they have no idea what they're going to do with them. And that place ain't cheap. I'm just saying. It's great, but it's not inexpensive. So many times I have been called into a space and they lay out their fantastic organizational tools and they're like, can you make this work? <laughs> like, sometimes I can, but sometimes I can't. Sometimes it's not going to fit into that cabinet or it's not going to fit on that shelf or it's not going to work for how, how you organize things. So one of the things to think about, most people I work with are very visual. Part of the reason why they have clutter is because they're afraid if they don't see it, they're going to forget about it. Does anybody relate to that? Yeah, that's usually a good portion of people I work with. So what you need to do is create visual storage. So don't think about something with a heavy pattern. Don't think of something solid. Think about using a lot of clear things because you can stack that, you can label it, and you can see what's in there, right? So one of the things I suggest if you're doing a home office or if you keep your calendar and your schedule in your kitchen, use those, not super sexy, but those acrylic little hanging files, the wall files, use those because you can see what's in there. If you just use the heavy patterned ones, you can't see what's behind even that first page. So think about using visual storage if you're a visual person. But doesn't like the visual storage actually continue to make the room look it can, it can, but not if it's done in a way that's reasonable. So, for example, for a lot of clients, I recommend having two calendars, two months' worth of calendars up, and then next to those calendars, if they have kids, have one for each of the kids, and in the front, that's where you put that schedule or that field trip permission slip that needs to be signed, whatever's urgent for that week. Because to be honest, you could keep it in just one place, but are you going to maintain it? That's the tricky part. If you do need to see it to remember it, then sacrifice a little bit of that order to be able to see it. And if that's the only thing, if the papers are off the table and they're off the counter, it's not so bad. It's not so bad. It's probably an improvement on what you have currently, if that makes sense. OK. So we're up to step four, which is where we're talking about where would it make sense to keep these things in your room, right? That's when you're doing your brainstorming deciding how to organize it. This is, a, like I said, a very time-consuming step, but this is really where the rubber meets the road. This is where you're going to make a big difference. I recommend to people, no matter what room you're working in, have three trash bags or three laundry baskets if, if you need to see what you're doing a little bit more, and have a donate, a throw, and a keep. Right? We can always, we can always fill a donate. We could, I've never worked with anybody where this each basket did not get filled. Yes, I've had some where the keep is significantly bigger <laughs> than the donate or the throw, but trust me, there's stuff there that you don't need, right? So I would recommend using a system like that as you're sorting through. And once again, once you get to that keep pile, really think about, is this going to be efficient in this space? Can I use this in this space, right? Hello. OK. Step five is kind of the exciting step. So step five, you've made your list. You've put away things that belong in that room. You've put away things that belong in other spaces. You've figured out how to store what's left over, whether it's in that space or if it's going in another room or another storage area. Now we're at the point where a lot of people only dream about. Now you can really claim this room as your own. This is the time to think about, how do I want to use this room on a daily basis? What kind of colors do I want on the wall? What kind of fabric do I want on the couch? This is when you can kind of get creative. It's a nice reward for the kind of grunt work that are step one through four. <laughs> this is the time where you're really going to know it's worth it. It's worth it. And remember that the pain of letting something go is very quickly replaced. 12 years of experience, very quickly replaced with the elation of actually being able to function in a room. Now, I remind everybody. With very little exception, you're all paying a mortgage or rent. And it's probably not a little bit living up here. So when you give up space to clutter, you're paying to store stuff. You're giving up function in your life and in your home to store stuff. I don't know about you, but that motivates me. <laughs> I don't want to pay to store stuff. 
that's often unnecessary, right? So I promise you there's very little you won't, there's very little you'll miss. And all the years I've done this, I have never once had a client call me really upset that we got rid of something. Not one time. Never once. There's a couple people who are like, okay, we probably got rid of too many of the scissors and we need to go buy a pair. But no one who's ever called in any kind of heartbreak. And I encourage you to really research. <laughs> people tend to keep stuff because they think there's great value in it. Do your research. Spend even just five minutes on eBay and probably 80% of the time you realize, oh, this isn't worth the time it would take to list it and ship it. And that kind of frees you up to let it go. Um, great resource is FreeCycle. If you have something that isn't really high value, people love FreeCycle. And a lot of people in need use FreeCycle. So we've had really great success using them. I don't know this area super well. Do people, can anybody suggest? We have FreeCycle, and we also have a Halston Trading Post free Oh, great. Facebook. OK, and then what about like shops, re, like resale shops, donation places? We can actually we can sell your stuff on Halston Trading Post. Halston Trading Post, OK. Oh, that's great. And native. Okay. And if you have baby stuff, there's uh, kids stuff, there's also project just because. And new habitat place going in native where they take those. Oh, great. Perfect. Yeah. Restore. Thank you. Great. So there's a lot of places. There's also Big Brother Big Sister, which picks up. Uh, yeah. yeah, they do in our area too. And they'll yeah, take almost that's anything. That's yeah. That's yeah. That's yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, oh, and again. Senior yeah. class. And <laughs> It, it can be done in stages, you know what I mean? It can be one of those things where today I have 20 minutes. So I'm going to do 20 minutes of filling a box, especially when you get those little flyers in the mail that say, hey, we're going to be in your neighborhood. Call, make the schedule, even if it's only one box. That is one box less of stuff that you have to ever touch again. And it's going to go to someone who can use it. So that's beneficial. Any questions on the steps? Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is room mapping. This is a little something I created a few years ago. Did they make copies of the maps for you? One. Okay, perfect. So the one that you have probably says Kelly's room. Yep. Okay, this is an actual client of mine. The reason I started room mapping is I worked with a mom who had six kids, and she was lovely and very motivated, and then her six kids and her husband came home. <laughs> <laughs> They had no idea what we had done all day and really didn't care that much. So I created this and we hung it by their door and we labeled very roughly, right? I don't have an architectural degree, clearly. So it can be a very rough sketch done with, you know, plain pencil and a ruler. And we wrote what went in each space. So this young lady had literally no excuse on why she could not keep her room clean. And again, if you're someone who's not strongly organized, not highly executive functioning, chances are you have an offspring or two who may not be. And they probably need this. They probably need this help. So you're building their muscle as well. It's really, it's a helpful task, especially if you've worked with them in that room, it's helpful. I would also recommend if you have kids, <laughs> make multiple copies of this, because several times I've gotten a call from a client where it's disappeared from their child's room. <laughs> which, you know, it's a great excuse of why you can't pick up, but <laughs> so make copies of it. Um, pretty straightforward, right? Any questions on that? Great. Okay. So next we have some ideas to get you motivated. So number one, as my dad called it, the KISS rule. Keep it simple. And then there was another word. So keeping it simple is really, really critical. You may see a great organizational system that sounds wonderful, but if it's a lot of work to maintain, are you going to do it? So one of the things, uh, no offense to anyone else professionally, but I run into clients who have gone to some kind of workshop, read some kind of book, and they want to do the tickler file that has a folder for every single day of the month. That sounds like a nightmare to me. Now that just sounds like work. I have to pick up this manila folder and see what I need for the day, and hopefully that's what I need for that day, or I have to dig through it. I just think that's a nightmare. I love having a folder for every month where I keep project sheets, menus, event sheets, stuff for the kids, reminders that the library is having a great program, which by the way, sounds like you guys have really good programs here. I'm not just saying that because I'm here, but those sounded really fun. Um, so uh, keep a, a system that's manageable for you. Again, if you're a visual person, maybe the best idea for your papers is a lateral file that sits on your countertop. 
and you have something for home decorating, something for your clubs, something for school, something for work, a medical file, receipts, something that's easily accessible. Because if the step of taking this to an additional room and putting it in a filing cabinet sounds overwhelming, listen to that vibe. Listen to that vibe. You want to keep it simple. If you're busy and you're working, busy like I am, then you need to keep it in an area that you're going to be in. Right? So there is a difference between long-term and short-term storage. Right? Short-term are the things that you're using now and the things that are upcoming. Pretty much everything else is long-term storage or trash. <laughs> right? So how many years do you guys need to keep tax information? Seven, Seven years. With very little exception. If you are in a business where you keep personal information for people, talk to your accountant, it may be a little bit different. But in general, seven years. And what I do is I keep long-term storage. All my files like that are in one place. When I put all my stuff in April for the, for the previous year, I take that last one out and I shred it. I never have more than seven years' worth of data in that box. And that box has been with me for 20 years. <laughs> so that's my long-term storage. So everyone's home should have long-term storage somewhere. Now to give you an idea, I live in four rooms. I have one closet that are underneath stairs. That is all my long-term storage. That's it. But that's the point of that closet, right? So if you have a basement, if you have an attic, if you have a spare room, if you have a closet under the stairs, designate a space for long-term storage. So what other things would live in there besides tax papers? Christmas ornaments? Luggage, off-season clothes. Off clothes, yeah. Anything that you don't, and obviously put the stuff that you really don't access deep in the back. So for example, I have a box labeled baby quilt, and it is filled with my son's baby clothes that I have high hopes are someday going to become a quilt. My son is 14, <laughs> so that's way in the back. I feel justified in giving it room in my long-term storage closet, but it's way in the back because I'm realistic that that may not happen anytime soon. I don't even own a sewing machine. So sometimes you have to give space to something like that and it's okay, right? All right, um, also, when- How do you know that when you're starting to give it too much space? That's a, no, that's a good question. I think with anything, I like the rule of five. So if you're a creative person who likes projects, don't have more than five projects at once unless you have a heck of a lot of free time chances are you're never going to get to anything beyond this. So try to be discriminating. If you have a lot of keepsake memories, it's time to take a step back and look at that stuff and give yourself a specific amount of space. So for example, if you like keepsakes for your kids, assign a good size pretty box to each of your children and really try to be consistent with only using that much space. Um, and I would, if you have older kids, ask them. Ask them if they care if you hold on to it. 99% of the time they're gonna be like, uh, no. Just so you know, most of the time they don't really care. So you know, keep enough things that when you open that box and you take out the little outfits or the pictures or the cards or the letters or the drawings in second grade, that's great to get joy from. You know, then you can actually use that box and experience that box. If you have 17 plastic bins filled with every single piece of paper that they ever brought home from school, trust me, you are never gonna look in there. That has now become a burden. There's no joy in that. So give yourself an amount of room that feels like joy. You're like, you're speaking to me. <laughs> yeah, so I recently went through my kids' boxes when I was opening up the, the, their paperwork that they had brought home from nursery school again, my three and my seven year old. And, uh, That's commitment. Like, well, obviously, you were learning about the color yellow because it was just pink all over it. So, yeah, and you know what? One example is okay. A million is not. Um, it's another point that's on this list. If you're gonna keep something, keep it in a meaningful way. Keep it in a way where you can access it and it can give you joy. So for example, those great 12 by 12 scrapbook folders that you see everywhere, it's really easy to just slip artwork from your kids or examples of their writing, if that's something that you're struggling with. Those hold them and now you can look through them like a photo album. You're never going to take that plastic box from the bottom of the pile in the basement or the guest room or whatever space you've stored it in and sit and go through it because it's just overwhelming. And I don't know, it's not, it's not pretty, it's not fun. You can't bring your cup of tea or your glass of wine in with you. It's, you need to have it stored in a way that's meaningful. So if you have a collection of something from a family member who's gone, store it in a way that's meaningful. Frame it, put it in a shadow box, 
put it somewhere where that joy is sparked all the time. Again, instead of in a box, in an attic, labeled something. So a perfect example, I had a client who um, had a collection of pipes. And they were like really cool pipes, stuff I've never seen before, very intricate. And he had two boxes full that had been his grandfather's and his great-grandfather's in uh, Israel. And they were really cool. So we went and got these really specifically made uh, shadow boxes. And in his home office, he ha now has these three boxes with these really, now it's artwork. Now when people come in, they're like, hey, that's really cool. I didn't know you could smoke out of something that pretty. They're really interesting looking. And now they're on display. And now they give him joy. And now his wife doesn't have to keep carting those things around when she's trying to find stuff in the attic. So be meaningful. Be meaningful, be thoughtful. But not so thoughtful on that note. Not so thoughtful that you can't let something go. So one of the things that hinders my clients a lot in an age when we're told to be purposeful, they don't donate something because they're thinking they're going to find the perfect place to donate it. Sometimes there's not a perfect place. You're just going to have to trust that God can work that out. <laughs> that that stuff will get where it needs to go. So don't be precious about it. I mean, I have one client who I worked with her for probably about a year and a half on and off. And she had this ginormous entryway in her house. Beautiful potential in that space. Every single time I came, she had a collection of Trader Joe's paper bags. And all of them were filled with things with, you know, this is little girl stuff. This is little boy stuff. These are athletic shoes. I don't know what she was thinking if she was going to try to contact individuals that she knew, but it lived there forever. I was like, make one phone call, get up on one day early and get that stuff to the end of your driveway at 7 a.m. Have you ever seen them come at 7 a.m.? I guess they have to start somewhere, but, and let it go, let it go. So don't be too precious when donating. So one of the other things I always recommend on this topic is in your home, have a place for two things, returns and donations. I recommend if you have the space in a garage or in an entryway to keep things like that there. So returns. Statistically, 90% of the time, you know you're going to return an item within an hour of bringing it home. 90% of the time. So I recommend stick it in the bag, stick the receipt in the bag, put it in your car, or put it in a shelf, on a shelf you know, near, that, near, your, near where you keep your car or where you come in and out, so that there's no excuse not to return it. If you bring that into the house, deeper in, or if you bring it into your messy space, you know it's going to happen. It's going to get buried because it's not a priority. So if you keep it somewhere very easy to access as you're walking out, oh, I'm going in that direction today. I can return it. I say the same things with donations. Have one spot, not necessarily when you're doing the big projects, but on an ongoing basis. Have them in one spot. That way, when it gets filled, if it's clothing, you can swing by and drop it in the bin. If it's something where you want to call Goodwill or the Boys and Girls Club, when you see that it's filled, okay, time to call. Next time you get the flyer, say, I'm in. I'll have it at the end of the driveway at 7. They don't mind coming for one box. I think Boys and Girls Club, they'll do up to like 38. They'll take a pretty big amount of stuff. But they don't mind coming for one either. It makes a difference. Um, we talked a little bit about scheduling already. I, um, I don't understand why, but for a lot of my clients, mail is a big deal. Mail is something that trips them up. Um, so I think because I'm someone who my job and my nature need me to be very decisive, it's just that muscle that I have, it is something you can build over time. So when mail comes in, I recommend opening your mail right next to your recycling bin and your trash can. You occasionally will come across something you need to shred, but typically, there's three categories of mail, right? Something that requires action, something that needs to be kept because it contains important information, which means it probably needs to go to your long-term storage for papers, or coupons. <laughs> That's the other one, really, right? Something that you might use in the next month or two months. So for coupons, I recommend using a little container. I'll show you what I use. It literally goes with me everywhere. These are my coupons. And in here, I organize them by the stores I go to the most. So there's clothing, staples, creative stuff like a Michaels or an AC Moore, and the grocery store. It's really easy. You'll always have them with you. You never leave them in the car by accident if you have room. And what I do is if I'm stuck somewhere, 
like waiting for my kid to get done karate or I'm meeting someone for lunch or inevitably I go to a client's house and because I tend to work with disorganized people, they forget I'm coming and they're like, oh, I'll be there in like 20 minutes. <laughs> this is when I'll go through something like this and take out anything that's expired. Really easy to maintain and you'll actually use the coupon. If they stay in that pile of papers on your counter or on your dining room table, the chances of you, A, remembering to bring it, and B, being able to find it in the time that you need it are much, much reduced. So use something like this in your purse or in your car if you really don't have room. Um, Bed Bath & Beyond, they never expire. Do you guys know that? The printed coupons, they never expire. So I always have like five or six of those in there because I'm forever going there for a client. <laughs> okay. Uh, we talked about deciding if something is important, keeping it in a meaningful way, right? We talked about that. Um, we talked a little bit about this, too. When organizing children's areas, use that kindergarten model. Think about that room, whether it's a playroom or their bedroom. Think about it being a kindergarten room. In kindergarten, it was really hard to be messy because everything was labeled and everything had a home. That was the way it was functional. If you keep it that simple, your kids are going to be able to maintain it. And as I was saying earlier, if you have little, little ones who can't read, stick a picture of what belongs in there. And now, again, you're building that muscle for them. They're learning how to be decisive. And they're learning how to pick up so you don't have to do it all the live long day. <laughs> so a lot of Legos in the world. <laughs> so teach them to pick up, too. Um, I like having a place for my grocery list. Mine happens to be the side of the fridge. I like having a list for home office type stuff that you don't need that often, but you know, once you realize, okay, I'm going to need ink, I'm going to need paper, a trip to Staples is in order, it's nice to have it all written down in one place so you're not going back four or five times. Uh, same thing if you're a crafty person, have a craft list. If you're a sports person, have a sports equipment list. Have somewhere that you can go real quick when you know you're going to hit that store. And I like having like a whiteboard or if you, if you, if you like to write a notebook, uh, or for a lot of people, you can even use your phone now, have a place where you keep kind of an ongoing to-do list. And if you're wondering how to tackle the to-do list, one of my favorite things that I instill in my clients, I like to call it my hour of power. The hour of power is where for that one hour, you do the things on that to-do list that are unenjoyable. Then reward yourself. Have an hour of power, and then have an hour of reading, or binge watching Netflix, <laughs> whatever it is that is your bliss. An hour of power, if you only have to do it for an hour, you can do almost anything. You can make that phone call that you know you're going to be on hold for 20 minutes. You can do it then. And what I recommend is before you have your hour of power, schedule what you're going to do. So look at your to-do list. If you know tomorrow's a slow day or next Tuesday's a slow day, I'm going to have an hour of power. Prioritize in your to-do list what really needs to get done. So I was just working a couple weeks ago with a client who's a nurse and her license was about to expire. So she was like, I really need to fill out this paperwork. So I said, when's the soonest time you can do an hour of power? That's your priority. Then pick a few other things to do. Here's what happens. If you approach that hour of power without an idea of what's, what you're going to do, you kind of tend to pitter it away. You waste too much time deciding what to do or trying to find the paperwork for what you need to do. If you decide ahead of time, that only takes about five minutes. And then when the hour of power comes, you are armed and ready to go. I even recommend setting the timer on your oven or on your microwave, because when that ding happens, it's like freedom. It's awesome, I'm done. It's a really easy way to manage time and not have to think, I have to do this all day, or I've only got five minutes. So if you can fit an hour of power a week, you will see that that to-do list will start coming down. If you're someone who has more flexibility in your schedule, do a couple, because you really will see that stuff being done. And if the to-do list is a little less, it'll never be done, right? I think we all know. Most of us will go to the grave with stuff on our to-do list. That's just the nature of life. And I kind of feel like it's a blessing. That means we have the freedom to do these things. But there are things that need to be done in a timely manner. So if you can manage those on an ongoing basis, you'll find your downtime is a little deeper because you're not thinking about what you should have done. You're not as worried about when you're going to get it done. You can just kind of relax because you know, oh, I've got an hour of power coming up in a few days. I can really afford to sit and relax a little bit. All right, any questions on any of those? Any of those tips? Any questions about something that anyone's struggling with? Paper. <coughs> 
my office, my desk is really the thing that just sort of deep sixes me constantly because I am visual, so I do tend to leave everything in piles that just sort of, you know, and then the piles just become. So what types of things uh, typically is on, are in those piles? What kinds of papers? Um, anything. It could be things to file. It could be chalk. It could be invoices I have to send. It could be uh, reading material. So work-related as well as it could be personal? It could be. Okay. And so, and so files and files. <laughs> and, and project after project after project, and each project has, you know, its own right. collection of junk. So do you have wall space? Oh, yeah. I would say utilize the wall space and start, again, if you use those clear files, they're not sexy, but they allow you to put things in their place, take a step back, and see. This is what I have here. This is what I have here. It's almost like a visual checklist of what you're doing, and it has a place to live. So then on your desk is just either the most urgent stuff or the stuff you're currently working on in this moment. The nice thing about that is you don't, you're not tucking it away somewhere where you can't see it. So it's very easy to walk in and say, this is what needs my attention, and then figure out how to prioritize it. But I would say if you, get, if you can get it up off the workstation and you know, use something that's more clear so that you can still see it, you're not losing that visual reference. Mm -hmm. And honestly, your desk has a limited amount of space. So chances are you've stacked stuff, right? And you can only see the top. Right. <laughs> You're one of those people who, like, you can move around the pile. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What do you need? I'll get it. Yeah. I have worked with a lot of people like that. And when I first come in, I terrify them because they're like, You're going to mess up my system. And it gets messy for a few days, but then it gets better. Then it gets simpler. So I would also say if your two file pile is big, that needs to get prioritized on your hour power list. Okay. You know? We all have tasks that we would rather not do. <laughs> you know? This, uh, for me, I don't know why, but making medical appointments, every time I need to know, I know I need to call the doctor or the dentist, I know I'm going to be on hold, I know I'm not going to get worried, <laughs> I know I'm going to have to figure out my sketch, I don't know why, but I avoid that until I get to the point where, okay, I need the hour power now <laughs> to make sure I get that done. Did you have a question? Well, I have piles of stuff that I'm just not sure where to put them. I know I don't want to get rid of them yet. So again, my first question is what type of things? Um, some of them may be information about travel. I mean, I guess some of them could be categor categorized as, as I'm speaking. Um, but like, even I have like notebooks that have information in them and it's like a lot of different things. And I have school papers and I'm a teacher. Okay. And, um, things that I think I'm going to need at some point, but... Okay, so my gut instinct is that you're probably a bit of an info junkie, okay. that you like information and that you like yeah. to keep information. Mm -hmm. So two recommendations. One, we live in the age of information. There's very few articles or subjects you can't research literally within 60 seconds. Okay. You can have a lot of places to go. Now, sometimes we come across like a great article that's very specific to our job or to our stage of life. So I recommend having a folder in your car and put information like articles that you want to read, rip it out of the magazine, throw the rest of it away or recycle it, however you want to deal with it, and put it in a to be read file and try to limit yourself to about 10 things. Mm -hmm. The reason I say the car is again, I seem to be sitting in the car <laughs> perpetually waiting or I'm not sure how long it takes to get to a new client and I'm 15 minutes early. And let me tell you, I've learned over the years, you do not want your professional organizer to come early because you've probably forgotten I'm coming, and then you remember it, and now you're scrambling because you're embarrassed at how messy your house is, which we don't really see, but that's okay. So I've learned, find a parking lot and sit for 10 minutes because I do not want to ring that doorbell early because it just stresses somebody out. So that's when I'll sit and read. If you have kids that play sports, if you're sitting at the doctor's office waiting, you know, getting your oil changed, there's little pockets of time. That, that's a great time to then pull out that article and read it. Um, if it's like creative ideas... I would limit yourself to a folder in your filing cabinet that says creative ideas mm -hmm. and every now and then purge it. If it's schoolwork that you need to go back to or you may reference the next year, that probably needs to have a long-term home. So whether that's a uh, file box in your long-term storage or in your home office, depending on how it's set up. I think professionally, so statistically, the professional stuff that we keep, we tend to reference a little bit more than our maybe someday 
files, or maybe someday files we hardly ever go back to. So I would say let a lot of that go. Um, the other thing is you can very easily throw up a Word doc on your computer and write down the article name or the magazine name, or if you're a catalog person, I have a lot of clients who love catalogs, but you know it's not in the budget for you to order from it right now, throw that catalog website and the 1-800 number and the name on this sheet on your computer. That way you know you can go back and reference it, but you don't have to store that catalog. You don't have to keep it. So I'm also a homeschooler, so I have homeschool stuff that I keep that are like kind of reference stuff, some stuff that I have to keep legally, but then other stuff that I'm like, oh, maybe someday when he gets to that grade or if he decides to pursue that sport or whatever, then I'll put it on the computer. That way I don't have to physically store it. And again, age of information, you can find it. So when I say I know what it's like, I'm a single mom, I'm self-employed, and I run a company by myself, and I homeschool. So I know what it's like to juggle a lot of balls and be busy all the time. But if you can do it in a way that's more organized, it makes you so much more functional, and it just takes a lot of stress off. One of the things I see with a lot of my clients is they waste so much time and money. They can't find something, so they buy it again. They can't find something, so they're late. There's this kind of snowball effect on how being disorganized, deeply disorganized. For some people, it's just they could use a spruce, but for people who are a little more deeply disorganized, it does affect your quality of life. It can affect your relationships, it can affect your kids. It's one of those things that if you can build that decisive muscle, that's the number one thing you need to do. You need to be decisive. There is no organizational system in the world that's going to do that for you. There's no hook that will come and find your kids and say, please put your coat on me. <laughs> There's no file that's going to come, hey, did you get any mail that needs to go on me today? That doesn't exist, unfortunately. So it really is about building good habits and being decisive. And in the beginning, you need to be a little bit ruthless. In the beginning. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. And it feels so good. It really does. So that's why I love this job. I mean, there are days that I am digging through dusty boxes, sneezing my fool head off. That, okay, it's not the most enjoyable job. But the end result, when I see somebody take that deep breath and they know they can use their room, or they call me and they're like, guess what? I was on time for his soccer game, and he had his uniform, and I was in charge of snacks, and I remembered, and I brought them. That's awesome. That's such a victory for me. I love that. I love that. And it really does change the quality of the life that you live and how you relate to other people. That changes, too. And it's, it's a cool thing. Any other questions on specifics? So um, my husband and I have moved a lot before we were married, and each of us sort of had like the box that never got unpacked. And then kind of kept going. Yeah. So it seems like in every room in our house, we have some area that needs improving. So when we're doing these steps and finding like something that shouldn't be in that room and should go into another room, I often get held up with, okay, now I need to find home. It belongs in this room. This room needs work. Where is it? So where am I going to put this? Where is this home? Now, right, they get so distracted that, by that space. <laughs> so now I'm like, but it's relating to the item that's in another space. Is it better just to leave that without a home and now it's clutter in the new room until I get into that room? I, no, I would say for whatever space you're actually working on. So for example, let's say you find a box of baby rattles and you're like, I don't need these now, but I'm going to need them eventually. Bring them into that eventually space and designate an area for things to be organized in that room okay. and leave it there. Because otherwise, it's going to get shuffled again and again and again. Right. And it's going to get in the way of the space you're actually working on. So don't be afraid. Again, I, I, even for people who have a lot of transition, I recommend the laundry basket again. Buy something inexpensive at Walmart or Target. And I put it in that room, in a corner, in a closet, wherever it fits. And that's where I put stuff that will go in that room someday when we get to it. That way it's not as over, you don't have to hunt it down either. And again, you're not moving it from space to space to space. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. You had a question? Uh, well, like Tupperware and different containers, you know, like I have sometimes I have my cover, small covers in the drawer and then I have the bowls here. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, should I have all the covers together? Maybe, I don't know. And then I don't, I just start throwing things in. Like so two things on Tupperware. Good question. Yeah. And I love, by the way, that we all call it Tupperware, although for any of us, is it actually Tupperware anymore? <laughs> but it's all good, right? It's like Kleenex. Um, 
I usually recommend looking at how much you have. Unless you're feeding an army, you might have a little too much. So maybe, maybe recycle some of that, or if it's in great shape, even donate it. Um, I like nesting the bottoms together and then putting all the covers in a large bin that's clear. So for example, I have the big, it's probably like this size. I have a, this is the biggest Tupperware dish I have. I have something like that. I have three or four of them nested, nested together, and those big lids are underneath them. And then all the other smaller lids are stacked from largest to smallest. You don't have to go that far. But from, I have them all stacked in there, and they're all kind of together. So I don't have to go in another drawer or another cabinet. So if you can make that work. Um, I also have in my long-term storage a spot where I have the really big things that you only use for like Thanksgiving or Christmas or that barbecue at your boss's house. I have a separate space for those. I don't let that take up my active kitchen space. So there may be some bigger pieces that you can separate out and put that in a longer-term storage or in like that shelf that's up above the refrigerator, <laughs> the place where you don't need to go that often. I would move the bigger stuff there unless you use them on a, on a routine basis. I would move that. Any other questions? Any other problem areas? Well, just sticking with the Tupperware, mm -hmm. it sort of relates to everywhere else in the room. You, you take that one thing out, you use the Tupperware, you wash it, and then you go to put it away, and you just sort of give it a little toss into the, the area. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not stacked nicely anymore, and the next thing you know, you're opening up the thing, and everything's coming back out at you. Mm -hmm. So then it starts living on top of the cabinets. Yeah. Because it doesn't fit underneath any. How do you get rid of that process? It's totally, it's like the cost-benefit analysis. That's really what we come down to here. Is it worth utilizing the space to become more disciplined? Because that's really what it comes down to, right? Again, there's no magic solution. There's no magic cupboard that you throw it in and it automatically sorts itself like a coin machine. That doesn't exist yet. <laughs> Again, it would be awesome. If anyone can think of a way to design it, let me know. I'd, I'd use it. But you just need to be disciplined about it, you know? I will say I had a problem with her method because I found that I would never put it back that way. You know, I would start I, when I in the initial organization for Tupperware. For Tupperware, I feel very good about it. <laughs> it's a system that finally works for me. Um, but I couldn't use her system because it, it was the stacking. It's the too many steps. It, yeah, it was yeah. too many steps, and then trying to figure it out, and then I would kind of do that, like. Well, now I need to have the small ones over here so yeah. I can see them really easy. So what I ended up doing is I got rid of any, I went through all my Tupperware, I got rid of Tupperware that even though it was good Tupperware, I, it just didn't fit together. And now I use like the Ziploc kind of disposable. Yeah. And what I do is it does take up more space, but I stack them, I, I only use certain sizes. Yeah. And so I stack them with their lids if, the, if I find that a lid gets missing or the Tupperware goes bad, you know, like the... the throw them both. Goes, then I throw them both away. Yeah. So if something's missing, but it's all spread out and it just is stacked. Right. Yeah. So I just have the covers. Right. And I, I actually only buy specific ones so that they will stack nicely together. The bottoms go on the top. But I also live with two other adults that... May not be as motivated to right. maintain. And then once one person does it, it snowballs. Right. Right. Well, it's great if you can enlist your family to get involved in that hour of power. So my child's been doing hours of power since he was probably four or five. And it, it works for us because it's not this open-ended, today we're going to clean the kitchen. And he's like, you know, like, that sounds great. So if I say, like, hour of power, I'm telling you, I can get him to do almost anything. <laughs> almost anything. It's only an hour, baby. At the end of the hour, we can, like, play Uno. We can watch Harry Potter, like, whatever you want to do. But I need this hour. And this is, I always say to him, this is part of being in a family. I give up certain things for you. This is your participation in being in a family. And again, I think that is so important to teach to our kids. It's part of being in a family. You don't have to love every minute of it, but if we go full force for an hour, we can get it done. So on that to-do list, if you have things that your family members can help, enlist them. And don't be afraid to start young. They maybe can't do an hour of power right away. You know, maybe it's like 20 hot minutes or whatever cute little thing you want to come up with. <laughs> but uh, I would enlist your family with it, too. And your point is great. Again, keep it simple. You know what's going to work for you. If you come up with a system that works, that's great. So it's, you know, some things are easier to maintain than others. I do have a client who has a uh, really deep drawer. She has like a, 
this kind of funky built-in. She has a super deep drawer, and at one point we were thinking about using it for all her recipes and her recipe books, which I know is a whole other dilemma. But it was deep enough to put all the books in. But for her, she was like, you know what? I just want a place I can throw the Tupperware. And I said, okay, here's my rule then. Limit yourself to that drawer. If you get more Tupperware than will fit in that drawer, you got to get rid of some. And that works for her because she's never going to bother matching the stuff until she needs it because that doesn't bother her. But just knowing, like, okay, we can use that. You know, it wasn't what it was actually designed for, but that works for her. It wouldn't work for me, but that works for her. Speaking of Tupperware, I've been wanting somebody to manufacture Tupperware that has all the same. It just gets deeper, and the covers are exactly the same. There is something. I have seen something like that. Yeah. 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 And I think they even came with like a little holder, right? Yeah. The yeah. holder's not very good. The, the little carousel's not very good. Right, because it takes too much turn room. Right. And like the biggest thing though is only like this and about like this tall. So you can't like Thanksgiving dinner school will not fit in the middle. <laughs> right. You know? Right. Um, but again, don't be afraid for those like super rare occasions where you need something ginormous. Use plastic wrap in a big bowl or use a Ziploc bag. I use that, those bags for everything, especially if you freeze like soups and stuff like that. Freeze them in the bag because there's no wasted room and there's no air, so it'll taste better. Speaking of recipes, do you have any suggestions? Let a lot of them go. That's my number one suggestion. Yeah, I have a box. Yeah. And if you cooked and three you meals a day home, for the next 20 years. I mean, it's more, you know, yeah. It's yeah. I love to go to cooking books and magazines where the recipes and I pour them all out. I'm like, one day, you know, fucking God name. Right, right, right. I put them in a folder and I filled, I filled it and I basically am like, I'm pretty much at my capacity right. for that reason. I picked what, and I did go through and be yep. okay. I Decisive. Know. Right. Yeah. There, There is software that's available that you can put your own recipes in. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I did with my recipes so that I could take the ones that I wanted, the ones that I got from my mom or my grandmother, and mm -hmm. went into the, the thing, and then you can always search on ingredients and things like that. I had a client who had a very good intention of scanning the recipes, but she had like three or four banker boxes. Sure. I was like, I would rather have somebody rip off my toenails than do that. That sounds awful. She did it for one hour, and she was like, all right, I'm ready. Let's come back, and let's just pick the ones that we're going to keep. So what I recommend is doing something real simple like this for recipes and I am kind of addicted to the little you know the little clear pages like this I slip a recipe in the front and a recipe in the back and I kind of limit myself this is how because again how much free time do I have to be and there's only us like how much cooking am I really doing so I keep that much and when I need inspiration I'm not overwhelmed I'm not afraid I'm missing anything I just go to that binder I find something that sounds good I put it in the front of the binder I, make, I add the stuff to my grocery list on the side of my fridge, and then I try the recipe to varying degrees of success. But then if I love it, I incorporate it into my long-term, like my big recipe file, or again, that would be the point where you'd want to put it on the computer. Yeah, so honestly, for most of it, I'd let it go. There's so much available online that you can, even though you may not know how to search for each individual recipe, there's lots of recipes out there that are available. And those websites are free, so... That's how I'd utilize it. <laughs> okay, it's funny you say that. I had a person ask during one of these workshops, what do you do with old photos? And she was in a position where she had people who had passed away in her family, and she had boxes and boxes of photos, and she had family who weren't really interested in taking the boxes. So I said, well, go through, take the ones you love with the people who you actually know who they are, take some of those, put them in a box, and then call your family and have a party. Have a tea party, have a cookout, lay the boxes out for them and say anything that you do not choose will be going away. It will be shredded or burned or however you want to do it. That way the guilt is off your shoulders. You know, because the worst thing is when someone comes to you, oh, I really wanted that picture of Aunt Martha. Well, then you should have come and taken it. Now you're providing an opportunity and a response. Remember when I sent you that Evite <laughs> for the picture party? I was serious when I said I was letting that stuff go. You know, because there's just too much of it. And I know we feel guilty because this is somebody, who, and it must have mattered because they took a picture, but I have no idea who they are. Yeah, let it go. Let it go. Like, I feel 
bad throwing things out. Like, I feel sad, and then I like sitting there saying, oh, you know, maybe I really do like those shoes. They're not that bad. <laughs> the great thing is we live in a world where things are very accessible right? They're super accessible. So one of the things I run into a lot for people are uh, the people who are the discount bulk shopping, the uh, BJ's and the Sam's Club. Those places give me agita. I can't even tell you. I see people rolling out with a cart and I want to chase them. Like, okay, how many kids do you have before you can take that? I, I just don't get it. I, I worked with someone recently who has this beautiful, huge laundry room. Like, she's just blessed. She has this great laundry room in her house. You can barely walk in it because there's tons of paper towels, tons of toilet paper, and there's two people who live there. Are they expecting Armageddon? Do both of them have serious IBS issues? The answer to both those questions were no. So I'm like, all right, it's time to stop bulk buying because here's the deal. Let's go back to that thought process of you pay a mortgage or rent on your space. So you're paying to store stuff. You can't use that room. Is it a deal anymore? No. It's visual clutter. It's emotional clutter. Let it go. Just buy. And is there anybody here who really can't get to a store to buy a roll of toilet paper or paper towels? I mean, other than a super big snowstorm, and even then, I have always been able to get to the store down the street within 48 hours, and I have not gone through 15 rolls of toilet paper, no matter how bad the storm was. You've got tissues in the, in the house. You right. You know what I'm saying? Hey, there's newspaper. We can go old school. Exactly. Exactly. So think about the bulk buying. It's not always the deal, it seems, when you think about how now this is something you have to manage, and this is something you're giving space. Chances are you're now losing money. Can I put the names for the policy organizations that you mentioned? Um, oh, sure. Donate yeah, you were saying? Oh, it's Holliston Precycle. It's Precycle. If you go to Precycle.org. Precycle. Yep. And on Facebook, if you're on Facebook, there's um, Holliston Trading Post dash free. And post dash free. Both of those, you're giving away can't expect anything in return. Mm -hmm. If you want to try to sell it, you can try to sell it to Halston Trading Post on, on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And they also have like other varying categories. Yeah, they have like a kids one and they have a baby's one. Cool. So if you sell cool. baby clothes, you know, it doesn't go on the main site, it just goes on the baby clothes. There's also Halston Yard thing. Halston Yard sale, mm -hmm. and there's also like a Medway Yard sale. Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing more and more towns are coming up with that, which yeah. I think is great. That's online, not online. Yeah. On Facebook. That's a Facebook group. Yeah, which is great because you always feel a little less sketchy when it's someone in your own town that's showing up at your house so you've never met. It just, just right. feels like a little safer. Well, I, I also know that some people that they don't feel comfortable giving out their home addresses, so they'll meet, meet at like a Shaw's or the library, library parking lot, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and if you if you meet in a public place, park close to the front. That would be my recommendation. Go, don't go to the back of the parking lot. Great. Any other questions? Okay, so I've included in the back some organizational resources. My information's on there. Should you have any questions or you're interested in booking, that information's there. Julie Morgenstern, I love. Uh, I brought a couple of the books if anybody wants to look at them on the way out. Um, for some people, reading about organization is almost as hellish as actually trying to get organized. I get that. <laughs> if you're someone who likes to read, she's a really good read, and she's just very logical and how she approaches organization, so I really like her. And I've given a, a blog that is really fun, this lady who just kind of comes up with these. Real, every now and then she'll come up with something that is even too far for me. That's even too OCD for me. But a lot of her ideas are great, and if you kind of search through the topics, you might find something, just a little inspiration. So I would say if you decide to kind of follow the steps or take on a room or a space, if you get stuck, jump online. Put in that area look for a good blog, you can find some really great ideas. And sometimes you can find a, a little bit comedic relief. Someone else will tell you how they're also struggling with it or how their husband's driving them crazy because they're not doing it or their kids are, you know what I mean? Like it's, ah, you kind of take a deep breath. This can improve the quality of your life, but it's not life or death. So being able to maintain a balance on that will make a big difference. So in parting, I would say two things. You absolutely can make a difference. I have seen it over and over again in the last 12 years. You can conquer chaos. It's never going to be perfect. Never. There's always going to be a space that can use a little extra work, but you can get it to a point where it's way more manageable. And I would say try to make it fun. Try to make it fun. And don't hesitate. If you want to shoot me an email, I know I'm not super close, but if you want to shoot me an email and you need some inspiration for something, please feel free to do so.
And that's it. Thank you very much.